Well, welcome. Welcome to Ascension. Welcome to Life on Mission. We're at action step number two right now. And action step number two, what is it, you might ask? It's what I just said. Welcome. That's it. Because welcome is a powerful word in our lives. Remember, we're doing this 40 days of mission, life on mission. We talked about last week of connecting because connecting is important. We can't hide from the world and connect with people. And we as people do a lot of hiding. I mean, have you ever noticed how quickly people hit the garage door closer when they drive in the garage coming home from work? People hide in their houses. Scripture says that hiding is for crooks, that we should be out in the world engaged with the public. Crooks hide. Anybody here from Iowa, don't raise your hand. I just, if you are, I just don't want to embarrass you because of what I found. Um, I found this story about a, a crooks from Iowa, and um, supposedly they had broken into an apartment, and there was a description on their vehicle, so they were out, the police were out looking for them, and they said the, the, uh, the crooks were described as wearing a mask. Well, the police found the car, pulled it over, and this is what they found. Yeah. Unfortunately, um, these guys used permanent marker to draw masks on their face to hide. Now, how drunk do you have to be to do that? Can I even ask that question? You know, <laughs> you know I hope that they didn't, uh, uh, they let these guys go because this is all over the internet and the shame that they've received from this is probably punishment enough for their attempt to break into apartment. I mean, how dumb, right? <laughs> but the truth is that we hide a lot. We can't be witnesses if we're hiding. We have one job, says God, one job. Our job is not to be a judge. We're not to be a defense lawyer for Jesus. We're not called to be prosecuting attorneys, beating up people with the Bible. We have one job, and that's to be a witness. Found some more one jobs. You had one job photos this week. Okay, you have one job. Know your continents. I mean, there, is only, there are only seven continents to know. You have one job. Know what color to print baby boy banners in. I don't think boys want pink. You have one job. Put hamburger buns and hamburger wrappers and hot dog buns and hot dog wrappers. That's your job. You have one job. Put the liquor in the liquor section, not the baby section. I think that's kind of important there. You have one job. Learn English. In trust we God. Okay. Well, we have one job. To be witnesses. That's what we're supposed to do. Jesus said, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. That's why we're still here on this planet. The first action step, like I said, is connect. We stop hiding and we start talking to people. This week, like I had, our action step number two is serve. Last week I mentioned again that we were going to make a, con a connection to the home, as using it as an analogy. And the connect we talked about being in the backyard, because the backyard is sort of an easy relationship. You know, you can come and have a barbecue and relax and be out there, and it's, it's okay. It's, it's a relaxed atmosphere. It's not too intimate. The analogy for this week for serve is allowing a person to come inside your house welcoming them inside your house. That's the next level. Now you're starting to get into more intimate, private space, from the backyard to the inside of the house. That's what step two, serve, is like. That's what Jesus seems to be talking about in our gospel lesson as well. And if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Luke 11 or Luke 10 if you have that and follow along here. Jesus was teaching about serving. 
teaching about serving. And he has an expert of the law come up and ask him a question. And the question was, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And how does Jesus respond? He doesn't answer him, does he? What does he do? He says, well, what do you think? And the expert of the law said, okay, this is what I read. I see, love God and love your neighbor. And Jesus said, you got it. Do that and you're saved. But the expert of the law wasn't good with that. He wanted a little bit more. And so he says, well, tell me about this. He says, I, I want you to tell me about this neighbor thingy. Which was a dumb question to ask because Jesus knew the heart of this guy He was a minimalist. You only do what you have to and nothing more, nothing beyond what the bare minimum is. Now, gentlemen, if you've ever asked your wife a really dumb question like, honey, I know I'm supposed to say I love you, so how many times a day do you want me to say I love you so that you feel loved? If you ask a question like that after 33 years of marriage, I know I'm a slow learner, If you have to ask a question like that, there are no amount, no set number of times you say, I love you today, that she's going to feel loved. Am I right, ladies? Because if you, you are supposed to give love freely, freely, even though it's not given back. So if you have to ask, who is my neighbor, you're a bad neighbor, It's guaranteed. You're a bad neighbor. Jesus knew this guy's problem. This guy was a gracist. And remember that, you know, a gracist. A gracist is a person who is, who says, I belong in the Father's house, but you don't. It's not about the color of your skin. It's about the color of your sin. And pride And prejudice are one of those sins that Jesus had to fight against constantly. And so to answer this neighbor thingy, Jesus tells the story of the good Samaritan. He starts off by saying, okay, (laughs) okay, so suppose a businessman was going from Jerusalem down to Jericho. That 17-mile stretch of highway Not a good highway, potholes all over the place, not well lit at all, you know, not many uh, patrolmen on that road either. And so this businessman was attacked by a gang who beat him up, took his money, and left him on the road for dead. But Jesus says, hey, no worries, no fear here, because there was a priest walking down that very same road. And if the businessman had any consciousness left in him at all and saw that a holy man was coming, he probably thought, hey, good, a holy man. I'll be helped for sure now. Wrong. Says that the the priest passed by on the other side. This was Jesus' way of saying to the dumb question guy, this is you. (laughs) Anybody who has has to ask, who is my neighbor, is a bad neighbor. Let me describe for you a bad neighbor, you Mr. Dumb Question guy. A bad neighbor is one who has to go out of his way to do, to avoid doing the right thing. Got it? Okay. But then Jesus continues on, no fear. A Levite was going down the road. You know what a Levite is? A Levite is one of those uh, people who um, is a clean freak. You know, it seems like in almost every couple, one of the, one of the two are, are, are clean freak. They want everything nice and neat and clean and, and put away. You know, there's always one in the couple there. They're almost OCD about it. Well, a Levite was OCD about keeping God's laws. Got to keep every one of them perfectly. And one of the laws that God had was that you don't touch dead people. Sounds like a good rule, Right. He said, man, if I, trip, if I go up to this guy and, and flip him over there and he's dead, I'm going to be unclean for seven days and I can't do my temple duty like I'm supposed to. Do you understand what his thought pattern is there? He's saying that God cares more about him doing his temple duty than he does loving his neighbor. 
So, in both of these instances, then, they walk around the guy. But Jesus makes it a point that he says that when they saw the victim, they may have seen the victim, but they really didn't see him. Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay, here. Any of you see the movie Noah starring Russell Crowe? A few of you? It was weird. It was really a weird movie. I saw it when I was uh, on the flight from um, Amsterdam down to Kilimanjaro, and so I saw it in, in under kind of sleep deprivation, but, you know, it was just really, really weird for me. I mean, did the angels look like one of the people from Fantastic Four? You know, the thing, the rock angels there? It is just really strange. I don't recommend it at all. But anyway, there was a scene in this movie in which Noah gets this idea that he's supposed to kill off his family. He gets this idea that God only wants the animals to live and that he's keeping them alive just to take care of the animals and that his family's going to be eradicated. Well, at one point in the movie, Noah's daughter-in-law has twins. And in this really intense scene, Noah is going to kill these twins because he feels humanity has to be eradicated. But what's really weird is that the daughter-in-law is one of the characters from Harry Potter, and I just couldn't get past this, you know? <laughs> so he walks up to there, and, and Hermione is holding her twins, and Dumbledore's not around there, and as Noah is looking into the eyes of these twins there, compassion hits them. That's the only redeeming part about this movie. Compassion hits him, and he can't kill the twins. Seeing that, seeing those twins, he had compassion. That's what I call the lens of compassion. The priest and the Levite, they saw the guy, but they didn't really see the guy. You see what I'm saying? On one of the reasons that we have a hard time witnessing to our neighbors is that we really don't see them. We don't see them through that lens of compassion. We can't understand them, their perspective, and so we just pass by on the other side. So, Listen to the difference between the priest and the Levite in Jesus and how he deals with the crowd. In Matthew chapter 9, Jesus went through the towns and the villages teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing, um, healing various diseases. And um, then listen to this. When he saw the crowd, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. You see the difference there? Unless your compassion is greater than your discomfort level in dealing with your neighbor, you're never going to serve your neighbor. The priest and the Levite, they just didn't have it. But no fear, Jesus says, no fear because now someone's going to come along who will help. And who is that person who came along to help? The Samaritan. The Samaritan. He had compassion. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. There's a difference between seeing and seeing. He had compassion on him. The Greek word for compassion is splachna. Say it and say it that way, splachna. You know, spit on the person in front of you there, you know, splachna. It's a real, it's a real guttural word. It's a real guttural word. And you know why? Because the literal meaning of that word is a deep feeling in the gut. You see, it's more than just head knowledge or a heart yearning. 
It's a feeling from deep inside you. You feel it in your gut. I feel for you. You know, Jesus chose the Samaritan just to kind of rub it in the face of this gracist expert in the law there. Because Jews and Samaritans just do not like each other. It's like the Sunnis and the Shiite Muslims. They just as soon kill each other than talk to one another. Samaritans were half-breeds. And there is just no room in God's house for unclean, half-breed Samaritans. Yet, he was the guy who went and checked on the victim, who cleaned him up, who set him on his donkey, who took him to the hospital and gave him some money, sort of like his credit card at that time. And then Jesus adds almost a throwaway phrase that's really important there. He says, when I come again. What does that mean? It means he's not just one and done here. He wants to form a relationship. It's about a relationship. The mission of witness is about a relationship. Don't forget that. It's always about a relationship. He's just not going to help this guy take him to the hospital and never see him again. He says, I'm coming back to check on you. I'm going to form a relationship with you. Listen, if you or your small group are going to do a service project for your community or something like that to to make a connection with your neighbors, Don't do just a one-and-done type thing. I mean, one-and-done things are great, but it's about a relationship. And so Jesus then comes to them and says, I'm going, he, he mentions that this guy is going to form a relationship. And to close then this story, after kind of rubbing them in there that this is a Samaritan who did the right thing, He kind of leans his head over to the expert in the law and says, okay, guy, so which one of the three is a neighbor? And what does the expert in the law do? Uh, I guess the one who showed mercy. Couldn't even call him the Samaritan. Wouldn't even say the man's name. I guess the third guy did. (laughs) Yeah. So Jesus says, yes, It is the one who showed mercy. And then Jesus gets to the point for all of us. The next words were addressed to all Christians. He says to us, go and do likewise. Be my witnesses in Jerusalem Be my witnesses going from Jerusalem, going to Jerusalem. Be my witnesses on the road of life. Stop asking, who is my neighbor? And start asking, won't you be my neighbor? Mr. Rogers stole that from Jesus, you know, okay? That's what I'm talking about. Being a witness is not about a title. It's about a function. Going and being a neighbor to your neighbors. You know, the early church really got this. That's why it exploded in growth over the, over the centuries, those first three centuries there. Hadrian, a, a um, Roman Caesar who was a pagan, said this about Christians. He goes, look how they love one another. See how they love one another. They never fail to help the widows. They they save orphans from those who would hurt them. If they have something, they give freely to those who have nothing. If they see a stranger, they take him home as though he were a brother. Who wouldn't want to be a part of that church? Who wouldn't want to be a part of a faith like that? That's why Christianity just blew up in the first three centuries so that by the mid-300s, the Roman Caesar, Constantine, became a Christian himself. What Jesus is telling here is in step number two of serve is what our shirts say. Don't just go to church. Be the church in daily life. Go and do 
likewise. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses our human understanding, keep your hearts and minds. In Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We stand